after 40, the, the, like the liver is the bottleneck to fat loss after you're 40 because it's overburdened. And then what you do is you only drink water or apple juice. The apple juice kind of helps to loosen, you know, any cholesterol plugs in the liver. You take a couple of distilled water with two tablespoons of Epsom salt. And Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate. It's a laxative. So you're basically emptying the colon. You take a cup of organic olive oil with a cup of organic grapefruit juice. When you haven't eaten anything, it's like the bile is like ready to to submit all its, you know, I'm sorry, the gallbladder just wants to release the bile. And because the, the Epsom salt is a laxative helping to push out when you finally take all that olive oil, kind of like I call it like popping the zit and, and just, you know, push out all the little cholesterol plugs at the tip of your liver. Okay, good morning, folks. Welcome. Happy Tuesday. Today we have our guest here, uh, Mr. Eric uh, Gutman. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, this is this is two Eric's in a row, so this must be Eric week. Yesterday we had anti- Eric Sartori, so now we've got another Eric. So anyway, Eric, welcome. Let me, so, right, can you hear me? I can hear you. Awesome. Give me just a half and, second here. And it's Goodman. <laughs> Goodman. All right. Sorry, man. I know it was 50-50 on that one. All right. Well, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have, well... You shouldn't have two T's on there. Then I would, I would say, no, I'm just no it's two T's and two N's. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I mean, well, get it. there we go. Now I can see. All right, man. Thanks, appreciate it. Um, where are you located? I'm in Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville. Okay, we've got a member here, Brett. I don't know, if Brett's here today. He's in Jacksonville as well. A nice part of the world. I'm sure the weather's nice and warm where you're at. Where it's kind of chilly where I'm at. And you used to be in the Navy, correct? Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Yeah. I just retired from the Navy. Oh, nice. Okay. Okay. What did you do for the Navy? Yeah. And, you know, uh, the only house I ever bought was here next to Naval Station Mayport. And so I retired and you know how we can't like just relax. Right. So I immediately went into writing the book because I had been doing this program for like over five years online. And then the book just published like in November. And and here I am just trying to figure it out. (laughs) Got it. Okay. What did you do in the Navy, by the way? Uh, so in the Navy, I was first a naval flight officer. So that was doing uh, airborne reconnaissance in the EP3. And because I lived in Rota, Spain, and every wanted, everybody wanted me for my Spanish-speaking skills to either find lost people or connect with Spanish ops, I transferred to the foreign area officer community uh, serving Latin America. Oh, interesting. Nice. Well, it must have been fun, I would imagine. Yeah, the Navy... I tell you, the Navy always had good locations because they're almost, not always, but almost always, you know, on a coast somewhere, which is generally nice because you got the water. Air Force, they stuck you in the middle. I was in, you know, Cheyenne, Wyoming and, you know, different places. And, you know, so it was just like, eh. Anyway, well, tell us a little bit about your, uh, so what propelled you to write a book? I think your book is called like Fit Over 40 or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's, uh, so it's Fat Loss. Fat Loss Over, over 40. 40. Okay. Something, something, something over so, 40. Yeah. So it's funny because I think it's so it's like every year I tweak it. And the very first time I tried it, I have a friend called Stephen Santangelo. And what he said is, you determine your fat deposit rate for the day based on what you eat for breakfast. And they go like, what are you talking about? He says, well, if you don't turn on insulin, right, then you're not going to turn on the, the hunger and the fat deposit, you know, hormone cascades for the day. And I thought, okay, let me try that. So I started playing around with it and just doing that and eating carbs in the evening, uh, I lost, you know, 10 pounds. So I kept tweaking, tweaking, tweaking until, you know, before your book came out, I'm really happy it came out. The only reference we had was that Joe Rogan interview with Jordan Peterson, where he both explains what depression is, you know, what, what it, how it affected him. Mm-hmm. And how by going carnivore, he dropped 50 pounds, a lot of his medical things cleared up. So I had a friend uh, that, we, you know, we we're, we're in the, I, I call myself a human guinea pig because every time I see something, I go, well, is that really true? And I just create an experiment for myself. And if it works, I keep it. And if it doesn't, I just discard it. And I've had a lot, a lot of failed experiments. But what he said to me is like, it was a challenge. Do you want to see if you're addicted to food or sugar? I go like, what are you talking about? Go 30 days carnivore. And if you can't, it means you're addicted to sugar. And I think that's the kind of stuff that most military guys resonate with. I'm going to do this 30 day carnivore challenge. And so the real reason though I did it was because I, I heard the Joe Rogan podcast. And at that point in time, I think it was 2018 or 2019, mm-hmm. my, my eldest son, and I got four and just like you was going through anxiety 
And the reason was there was a brutal murder of some people that we knew, meaning that they hung in our house and he hung out with them, a student, a teenage and a six-year-old. And compounded with other things, it really was creating a depression, anxiety situation in him. Now, of course, you know that if you tell a teenager something directly, they're going to kind of resist you. So what I did was, you know, strategically, I played the Joe Rogan, Jordan Peterson interview aloud with my wife next to me within earshot of my son. So my son hears that and he says, hey, you know, I'd I like to try that. And I said, you know what, Maxer? I'm going to do it with you just to support you. I already made my mind that I wanted to do it as a, am I addicted to sugar? But the the interesting thing for me as a parent, with you have a teenager dealing with anxiety, depression, and then you're concerned about the implications of that on the far end, right? It really kind of helped to shift them away from that. What I didn't know was that he had a lot of gastrointestinal issues. And what I really liked about your book is that, you know, if you have anxiety, joint pain, or gastrointestinal issues, a carnivore diet really can do some great things for you. So that was kind of like my proof of concept right then and there. I lost 10 pounds. I did not want to lose weight. You know, I'm, I'm, I'll say that I'm, I'm happy that if I stop exercising, I, I will drop weight. But with the carnivore diet, I, I kept training. I, there was no caloric restriction and I dropped 10 pounds and my joint pain kind of, kind of improved. It was better. So I go, Oh, wait a minute. I'm dropping weight without trying with no caloric restriction. You know, joint pain's going away, which means sleep is better. My son's gastrointestinal issues and his anxiety got better. I said, I think there's something to this. And so fast forward now, what I've done in my personal life is like every year, you know, after New Year's or wherever, I, I personally do a 30-day strict carnivore reset followed by a liver cleanse. And that's every year for the rest of my life because I proved that it works. And then what I do basically is I eat carnivore. I'll eat two meals a day and I make sure that I never turn on insulin in the morning by having a carnivore breakfast. And then in the evening, I may eat carbs with the family. You know, if I had a, a big training session, I may eat rice. I may not, you know, but that's literally how I changed my eating habits for the rest of my life. Now, the interesting thing with, with specifically with men, you know, men either have 10 to 15 pounds or they have 50 pounds, right? But you rarely meet a guy with just 20 pounds. The beauty is that when you put them on carnivore, and I specifically prohibit them from doing any exercise in the first month, they'll drop anywhere from 10 to 25 pounds just in carnivore alone. Just the diet without any exercise will create more weight loss than if you follow the traditional standard is one pound a week, right? You know, the traditional method is you do 3,500 calories a day and in one week or 3,500 calories a week. And in one week, you'll lose one pound, which means that through caloric restriction, the best you could do is four pounds a month feeling crappy. Because when you do caloric restriction, you feel crappy, right? That's, that's well established. But when they did carnivore, they felt great. They slept better. Their joint aches went away. They had better digestion. You know, they they had an even emotional feel. I think that one of the reasons that vegans are so like abrasive and, and emotional is because they're, they're always like on edge. And I think it has to do with their diet because the minute you go carnivore, or at least you don't eat any carbs in the morning, you have kind of like an emotional feel about yourself. You know, you're not as upset, you know, you don't snap at people. Um, and that's been my experience and it's the experience of people I've coached. And again, it's not a big number. It's about 20 people a year. Cause I was still in the Navy and this is kind of like my side project. I'm just verifying that. My human guinea pig experiment is valid, so I need more guinea pigs, right? Um, and that's why every year tweaking it, tweaking it, tweaking it, it led to where we are right now, that when I left the Navy, I could actually write a book and had enough experience to have this is now a, a reproducible method where I can duplicate results easily with people. Let me go back to, you know, you. I guess you started this when you were active duty, apparently, because you just recently retired. So you a couple of years ago, you would have been... Right active duty Navy doing this carnivore thing, at least periodically. Uh, any concern with the Navy personnel? I don't know if you had a Navy, you know, flight surgeon or whatever the equivalent is in the Navy um, or anybody, you know, I mean, my impression is the military is, I mean, I guess it depends on who you talk to, but they, they're, they're, they're sort of, they, they definitely won't lean to a carnivore approach. I would imagine. How, how did it go within the, within the Navy as an active duty person? 
I guess I applied the don't ask, don't tell a policy. You know, I just let my blood work speak for itself. So I, I didn't, I wouldn't advertise it within the Navy. This is something that I would go on Facebook and I would go file chapter 40 coaching program, right? And then six or 10 people that I knew would, would go into it and I coach them and I would keep it separate from the Navy. And again, every, every May. So I'm going to be 50 in May. Every time I had my yearly blood work, there was no issues. So I knew that having carnivore, strict carnivore periods and then having, you know, roughly 50% carnivore the rest of my life didn't really have a negative impact. You know, I never had a meeting where uh, a flight surgeon or, or a Navy doc said, hey, you got to look at what you're doing because this is a lot of not at all. Everything's within normal range. And, you know, my health is great. I was always able to, during the PRT, I max up push-ups and sit-ups and I would always run the mile and a half in 11, 1130 because I don't run. Um, you know, I, I would only do six weeks of sprinting prior to a PRT. So that means that twice a year, I would only take six weeks to sprint and the rest with just uh, heavy weight training. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember my physical fitness test days and I would similar, you know, cause I, I didn't do the, I was a, I was an orthopedic surgeon in the, in the air force. I didn't, I just didn't participate in some of the stuff because I was just doing a bunch of jumping jacks and stuff. I was like, I'm not interested in that, but um so you know you get out of the navy uh so let me ask you because you said you've been tweaking you've been tweaking and you said there's no problem with your blood work now some people will do this diet i've seen got guys literally thousands of some people have increased ldl cholesterol some people see lower levels of folate some people see their thyroid levels a little lower uh their testosterone level will be variable um i tend to put a lot less emphasis on on the blood work than on the actual physical how they're doing clinically because i think the blood work can be misleading in many ways um what concerns do you i mean so i you know again if you're coaching somebody you can't practice medicine unless you have a medical license and so you, you know you can't do too much of that stuff but i mean are you seeing any problems with the people that you have actually you know got to to uh, stick to this program so the one concern i've brought been brought up to me and i just didn't work with them uh, is a person in their 50s who had kidney issues and they were told by their doctor to limit meat consumption. And at that point, I said, look, I'm not a doctor um, and you need to clear this with your doctor before you even do this. Now, most of the people I had were, um, let's say, businessmen in their, or, let's say, 45 to 50 range who, and this is the word they would use. So one day they would look at themselves and they felt disgusted. And I didn't do any promotion for this. So everybody I got was basically word of mouth. So the people that did the first one, they were happy. And then when I would do it every year, once or twice, they would refer people. So it was it was small because I was still in the Navy. I mean, I, I had my naval officer job as lieutenant commander serving in an embassy overseas. So this is like a side project. Um, and, and I kind of kept it private. Like I didn't bring it up uh, within the Navy or with the docs because it was just it's my little human guinea pig experiment. And I didn't let it cross over into my my maybe life. Now that I have uh, freedom, right, to to speak more openly of what I'm what I'm doing with myself and my body and those I've helped, uh, that's been the only concern. And and I, I like that in some of your videos they they address this kidney issue because I'm I'm not going to step in between a a person and their doctor. And if their doctor said don't eat meat because of your kidney issues, and I'm gonna and what I would do is I would refer them to your book. This is like, look, I'm not a doctor, but here's a book written by a doctor. If you want to try this, then, you know, read the book, you know, talk with your doctor about it. And I said, look, you're only doing a 30 day experiment. You don't have to commit to my lifestyle. Now, the funny thing is that most people, after they do 30 days, they go, I really like this. I don't go, I don't want to go back to the way I was. And that's why you can say, well, you can get an off ramp. And even if you're not 100% carnivore, you know, 24 7, 365, most people will adopt some of the tenets or, or will become a lot more carnivore ish. Than they were prior to that, because most people realize, look, it's it's the processed food, it's it's the seed oils. There's there's absolutely no defense for seed oils and processed foods. And in the book I wrote, because you know sometimes you know we need to go through this to understand. I remember, I was I was at the Navy Yard. I don't know, it was Panda or whatever, one of these Chinese looking you know fast food options. And I said, well, let me try to eat clean there. So I had teriyaki chicken with no sauce and steamed vegetables. And after three weeks of doing that, my lower back pain got worse. And I'm going like, I'm eating so clean. What the hell is it? And I was talking to my wife and I realized it's the oils in which they cook the food at the panda because those are seed oils. And then when once you completely remove seed oils, I think 
people get a huge benefit because if you're buying organic broccoli, organic chicken, and you're you know frying it in corn oil, all the all the health benefits went away. An interesting perspective. Let me. I'm going to ask you because there was something you said earlier, and somebody had a question about. You said you do a 30 day carnivore reset, then you follow it up with some sort of liver cleanse. Um, somebody's yes. somebody's interested. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by liver cleanse? The liver detoxifies stuff on its own. So do our kidneys. Why do we need to do a liver cleanse? And what right. is it? What is so, a liver cleanse? I don't know. So in the 1990s, there was a nurse called Holda Clark, and she wrote a book called The Cure for All Disease. Right. And when I was going to anti-aging and training seminars, like this came up and people were doing, it was kind of like a, like a party favor. Like, you know, you do this thing and, and you poop out these stones and then you feel better. And I said, all right, that's, let me get the book. What the nurse was saying in essence is that because the liver and the kidneys are the body's main detoxifying organs and, and the liver's also function and metabolism. She says a lot of people, if, if you have a toxic burden, then the liver can't do its job properly. And what she was saying is, which I don't know if that's true, but in practice, it turned out to be correct, is that if you were able to clear the liver, um, then the liver, by being less burdened, can do its job better. What would really attract it to me, there's a guy in Canada who cured himself or, or you know, no longer shows Crohn's disease and multiple sclerosis. Now, in, in Western medicine, those diseases are incurable, right? If you got them, you're stuck. All you can do is kind of work with the symptoms. So when I read this guy's kind of like bio, what he said is that after 10 years of battling with this stuff and everybody just telling him to suck it up, he says, I want my life back. And apparently he got into this whole liver cleansing stuff. And after 18 months of doing one liver cleanse a month, and they're not exactly pleasant, you know, uh, he was free of all symptoms of Crohn's disease and multiple sclerosis. But what, what the way I really tied it to the, to the fat loss after 40 is I was in a cruise with my wife and kids and, you know, when you're in a cruise, you're you're like a, a hostage audience. You're a captive audience. You can't go anywhere. So these little like 20, 20 year olds, you know, come out and, and it says something how to have a flat loss, you know, after four years, some, something like that, right? And I go, all right, I'll I'll see what they have to say. And what they said was that after 40, the the like the liver is the bottleneck to fat loss after you're 40 because it's overburdened. Now, what they were saying, which I completely think it's BS, is that if you buy their green algae supplement tabs at $120 a month and you take them for three day, uh, three months that your, your liver will clean itself. But when I heard that, I said, hey, let me go back to this nurse that said she had a system and it takes a day and a half. And all you do is you're like, you don't eat food, you drink water. Um, I added the apple juice because when I went to, because I can read Spanish, I was reading a book in Peru about the same thing and he was adding like the, the apple juice. And then what you do is, you know, you only drink, Water or apple juice until two. So only liquid to hydrate and, and make sure it's in your system. The apple juice kind of helps to uh, loosen, you know, any cholesterol plugs in the liver. Then at 6 p.m., you take a cup of distilled water with two tablespoons of Epsom salt. And Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate. It's a laxative. At 8 p.m., you take another cup of uh, distilled water with the Epsom salt. So you're basically empty in the colon. And you haven't consumed any food. And then at 9.30... You take a cup of organic olive oil with a cup of organic grapefruit juice. And what happens is when you haven't eaten anything, it's like the bile is like ready to, to submit all its, you know, I'm sorry, the gallbladder just wants to release the bile. And because the, the Epsom salt is a laxative helping to push out when you finally take all that olive oil, kind of like I call it like popping the zit and, and just, you know, push out all the little cholesterol plugs at the tip of your liver. Well, what happens is that afterwards, and this is what makes no sense to me, but I've had so many people confirm it, you know, first of all, people lose from five to eight pounds in just that day and a half in a healthy manner, right? But their skin gets better. Like I had a, a girl in Australia or a woman, she was tricky. She said, you know, like 75% of her psoriasis cleared up after the liver cleanse. And I said, I have no idea. And there's all these other things that what you're doing is you're basically unburdening the liver a little bit. But I, I basically took the real method from Holda Clark and, and I apply what these two young bucks were saying at the cruise. I think this whole green algae is bullshit, you know, and at $120 a pop, it's even more bullshit. And, you know, a liver cleanse you can do for under 20 bucks, just go into like Whole Foods or CVS, you know, what do you need? Distilled water, Epsom salts, organic olive oil, great food, done. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I'll say 
Um, so let me, because you said you continue to refine every year. So, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, I, I'm obviously very much a proponent of a carnivorous diet. Uh, and we have people that, you know, will do it and strictly for a while. Sometimes I'll add some things in. And, you know, that's totally fine, whatever's working for them. So what sort of refinements have you made to your own life? And, and then how do you apply it to uh, maybe people you you run into? So over over the last five years, I think two of the things that I started playing around with, and again, I think these are more of a mental strengthening than a physical thing, but I started adding like a 24 hour fast. So, you know, the first, because the other thing I started adding recently, I, I think you've heard of David Goggins. Have you, have you heard of this guy? Yeah. Yeah. He's a, yeah. He's a special forces guy runs all the right. time. Yeah. Yeah. Tough Did guy. Did you yeah. ever read his book? Can't hurt me. No, no, I haven't read his book. I was in, I was in outside magazine at the same time, same issue he was in. So I just remember that. So, that. But so anyway, I, I knew who he was before he was famous because he would appear in you know, like all the Navy SEAL ads. So I already knew and kind of liked him. So when it, the book came out in the very last chapter, it says that he had two open heart surgeries and he was 38 at the time. And he was making peace where if he had to die, at least he lived a full life. And then it says in the last page, or in the last chapter, that he remembered this system the Navy SEALs were using in San Diego, which helped to prevent surgeries in the special ops community. And that because he remembered that system, he started applying it. And then five years later, he was able to run 100-mile uh, ultras again. So I'm going because I was still active duty Navy at the time. I'm going, what the hell is the system and how do I learn it? So the, the progression has been to that I now add the Navy SEAL stretching system mentioned by uh, David Goggins because a lot of people who are, let's say, 45 and 50 pounds overweight, they've been eating horribly and they probably haven't worked out in five or 10 years. So the problem is that most people want to go into David Goggins mode, I'm going to run four miles today. It's like, no, you're going to like jack yourself up. So what I like, what I do with the first month now is absolutely no exercise, 30 days carnivore diet, but at the two week mark, we do the lower back reset of the Navy SEAL system. And what that does, it takes about two SEALs to get, I'm um, sorry, it takes about two weeks to regain the normal range of motion using the system. And what they found out is this. If you have the, the standard, what they call meeting the standard, if you achieve the standard of range of motion for spinal flexion, lateral flexion, rotation, and spinal extension, your likelihood of getting injured in an active career like say being a Navy SEAL goes greatly down and also your, your chances of performing on your optimal are greatly increased. So what happens is, of course, the Navy SEALs at first were laughing at this guy in this program because they thought, I don't need any range of motion, I need more power lifting. But, you know, whenever the specter of a surgery would come up, then they get scared because, you know, a surgery means you're off the team for 12 weeks mandatory. That's it. You're done. Like the, the minute the knife cuts the operator, you're off the team and you may miss a deployment, whatever. And then you have to go to rehab and you may not come back as good as you were before. Right. And of course, you know, there's the whole specter of, of opioid dependency because after surgery, part of the normal standard of care or post-op pain is opioids. Right. So a lot of these people get the surgery 12 weeks, but then they come back to the team with a slight opioid dependency. Right. So now there's all these problems. So when I went there, I would just pull the, the SEALs aside, you know, and show them, you know, in the Navy, just like them. I said, like, talk to me, like, for real, because, you know, it's a civilian was teaching it at the time. They're like, is this really true? And then one of the guys said, hey, look, we did an in-house study in Navy Special Warfare, and over an eight-year period, 400 surgeries were able to be prevented with, within Navy Special Warfare. I said, all right, at least now I talked, not to the guys selling it, but the guy, to the guys in the field. So now the main thing is, you got to kind of give people their health back before they can think about uh, working out hard. But what people want to do is that they're 45, they get disgusted, they go back to 18-year-old version of them or like collegiate athlete version of them, and they pick the hardest workout they ever did, you know, and then with their overweight body and joints out of whack, they go and they do it and they usually end up injuring themselves, which is what happened to a friend of mine who I worked with at Southcom because... He had been EOD, explosive ordnance disposal, and in the Navy, the SEALs trained the EOD, right? So he gets out of the Navy. He's doing one of these boring desk jobs for the government at Southcom. Because he wanted to progress, after South, after doing a full eight or 10-hour day at Southcom, he was University of Miami working on his master's degree. Finally gets his master's degree, and he's like, I don't know, 40, 50 pounds overweight. 
right? He feels disgusted with himself. Again, that's the word they use. And he was in his 30s at the time. So he goes, now that I've finally graduated, I can start working out again. So this guy in his 30s goes back into his mental closet of what he was doing when the SEALs were training him in his 20s, goes out with the tire flip and actually ruptures his liver from, from pushing too hard. That means his, his mind was strong enough to keep pushing because he had done it in the past, but his current body couldn't do it. And he actually like injured his liver or ruptured it and he had to go to uh, emergency. And so that is a very common thing with people who have been, you know, tough or mentally tough or trained in their youth. They go into their 40s without doing anything in five years, and they think they're just going to jump back into the toughest workout they did when they were 18, right? So on purpose, I've learned to just hold your horses and not think about any exercise until after 30 days or you've done 30 days carnivore, you've regained the range of motion in your lower back, and you've done a liver cleanse. And then after those 30 days, then we can start doing exercise. And, and that approach has worked. So it took me six years to get to that streamlined approach. <laughs> uh, but that is the one that's safest and the most effective. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of common sense. I mean, no one's going to, you know, I mean, if somebody's out there trying to kill themselves after five years of inactivity, they're definitely, you know, they're very, very likely going to get hurt. Um, your your book is titled Fat Loss Over 40. Why over 40? What's the, what's the difference? I mean, why, why not over 30? Why, I mean, how does it differ from a 20-year-old? I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, is there anything physiologically different in your view that makes the age 40 different than the age 35 or 25 or 60 for that instance? What I noticed was this. So if, if, if I could say there's the one question I heard more than any other repeatedly was this. They go, Eric, now in my 20s, whenever I put on a little bit of extra weight, I would just like work out a little bit harder, eat a little bit cleaner, and I could drop five to 10 pounds extremely easy. And then they go, after 35-ish, I do the exact same things I did to drop 10 or 20 pounds and the weight does not come off. And if it comes off, it, it maybe five pounds come off for a week or two, and then they come back with a vengeance. So that's why, you know, putting all these things together where after 40, you know, the inflammation is an issue, right? The, the range of motion is an issue. And in my mind, that, that little thing about the liver being the bottleneck is also an issue. So those are the three things that you don't really have to do when you're in your twenties. Like, like this is like this, right? When we were in our twenties, we could go out drinking until 2 a.m sleep four hours, go to the gym, have a killer workout, and then go to school and work like nothing, right? And I tell people like, look, if I have two glasses of red wine, and I don't drink, but if I'm, a, if I'm an official function, I'll have two glasses of red wine, I'm not going to train for the next two days because I already know they're going to be subpar training sessions. So clearly, as we get older, we have to train appropriate for our age. And I think a lot of the the forgivances that our body gave us go away. And I think the best way I heard it explained is that there's a movie called Lucy and, and Morgan Freeman is a scientist. And, and he said something I think is true. What he says is that life will forgive you until 30 in areas where, uh, uh, you know, resources are abundant because life wants you to procreate. So that means that until your 30s, you can do a whole bunch of things that are bad for you, and it won't really matter because, you know, according to the theory, the, the life force wants you to procreate. So it's going to give you a pass. But after 30, life uh, feels you've already procreated, and it doesn't forgive anything. So after 30, it's like everything counts. This idea of going out drinking till 2 a.m. and waking up at 6 is not going to work. I mean, you can try it, but it's not going to feel the same. There's a definite think difference in the way our bodies adapt to training loads and bad diets that we can get away with a lot in our 20s that we can't in our 40s. In our 40s, our diet has to be on point. You know, in your 20s, you can overdrink or do drugs, recreational or pharmaceutical or otherwise, and it won't slow you down. And if you've been doing that for 20 years, when you get to your 40s, that's going to slow you down. You're going to pay a price for that. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think today we have 20 year olds are that are horrible and horrible, morbidly obese, type two diabetics, arthritic already. I mean, so I mean, I think unfortunately, because of the the ubiquitousness of the garbage that everybody's dealing with lifestyle wise, whether it's, you know, not sleeping, uh, being completely sedentary and eating complete garbage diet, I mean, even that, the advantage you have youth is rapidly 
diminishing. And I think, you know, I think over time you have this cumulative effect of all these negative things that you could, like you said, in 20, you just haven't been damaged enough yet. You just haven't taken as much damage. And then when you get to be 40 and your knees hurt, it's not so fun to go out and run sprints, you know? And, and so people tend to not do that. And I mean, you, maybe in your mind, you're thinking I'm pushing myself hard, but you were probably going faster and running more as a 20 year old. And so I think ultimately it still comes down to, you know, the overall workload and, and, you know, diet has a big role here. Um, do you, uh, so there's, there's a lot of now versions of the carnivore diet. There's people out there that's, you know, they'll call it a carnivore diet and they're, they're piling in a bunch of fruit and honey, which I would say is, you know, call it whatever you want. It may work or not, but it's not in my view, a carnivore diet, but, and there's people that, um, are eating sticks of butter and there's other people that are that are focusing on protein and limiting fat where do you fall on that when you do a carnivore when you recommend for your clients what do you what do you find more success with so to me the most successful of all approaches is if you can for 30 days focus on angus beef burgers and ribeyes mm -hmm. and for the first two weeks i i asked them to avoid eggs and all the other things is it's funny like I, you tell a person you're talking to a grown adult meat water salt coffee black and then but can i eat guacamole let's, let's go back meat salt water maybe coffee black coffee can i eat chicken no let's go back again right so for the first two weeks i i asked them and here's the funny thing right when i work with people for free they might jack it up. But when I've had paying customers, they follow it to the T because they go, well, if I pay this guy, I better do it by the book because otherwise I can't hold them accountable, right? So the first two weeks I go ribeyes and Angus beef burgers and salt it with Himalayan salt or, or, you know, or Celtic sea salt. After two weeks, because, you know, the problem is not the nutrition. The problem is, is the boredom that people feel because, you know, they feel great. They just want to taste something different or like we've been used to this idea of snacking at the two week mark. I say, all right, now you can add like either four, uh, four, uh, is it fried pork rinds or fried pork cracklings? Because that way, after you eat, if you're watching TV, now you have this little finger food that you can put in your mouth and it's still fat and protein. It's the skin of the pig or it's a skin with a little bit of fat in the pig. And that helps to hold them over. And then at the three to four week mark, I say, well, well you can introduce one thing at a time just to see how your body reacts, right? Because I think you're the one who points out in your book about, you know, inflammation can come anywhere in from four days. So you can eat something on Monday for breakfast, and you won't feel the inflammation until Thursday. So by having a strict, you know, elimination diet and adding things, you know, systematically, they can find out for themselves whether eggs are good or bad for them, whether dairy is good or bad for them. And also because I'm asking them to get on the scale every single day, because, you know, you know, by tracking, then you see how it affects them. Because the other thing about it is like, I don't like people taking me on faith. And what I mean by that is, let's say somebody starts and they'll say something like this. Eric says that I need to do carnivore and I'll lose from half a pound to two pounds a day, right? Once they start doing it on their own and getting on that weight scale on their own, they realize, oh, if I eat this way, I'm dropping half a pound to two pounds a day. Great. Then at some point around the third week mark, they think the rules don't apply to them. And, you know, they'll eat something which they think is not going to affect anything because they just had a little bit of guacamole or they just had, you know, a couple of chips and salsa. But the weight will immediately come up. And what happens at that point is it's no longer faith in Eric or, or Sean Baker or the carnivore diet is if you eat this way, the unwanted weight will come down. The minute you go back to starchy carbs and processed foods, you're putting two to three pounds in one day to your frame. And at that point, that's why I don't get mad when they have a cheat day or fall off the wagon, because first of all, nobody's perfect. But second, at that point, they realize that they don't need to have faith in me or my words. They verified for themselves that if you follow a program, weight comes off, you get off it, weight comes back on. And then at that point, it's a personal choice. Because, you know, we always, from the struggle, how many pounds you need to lose? It's either 15 or, or 45, right? See, it's either a one-month program or a three-month program. And I think, and then at the 30 day mark, some people want to stay on carnivore for two to three more months. And some people want to start having either a cheat day or, you know, how can they incorporate other foods? And that's when I said, look, you're, you're going to do what you're going to do. But two suggestions are this. There's a guy called Frank Suarez. He wrote a book called The Power of Your Metabolism. And what he developed was a visual system. He says, 
you divide your plate into four equal portions, right? So each portion is 25% of the plate. And he said, if you fill 75% of the plate with meat and veggies, if you want, but you can just do meat, then you have 25% of the plate or carbs, whatever you want, whether it's a donut or toast, right? But by having no restrictions and having it be in visual system, he has achieved a lot of uh, success with people where, where nothing else works. And I think the reason it works for people is because nothing is forbidden and it's a visual system. So if you want to have cheesecake, okay, you look at your plate. And if you put ribeye in three quarters of your plate and then just 25% of the plate is cheesecake, you can get away with it, you know? And so that would be the off ramp. But in my mind, the, the best thing is to adopt a lifestyle that you don't have to drop drastic amounts of weight from. So for me, what I tell them, what I do, right, is every year for the rest of my life, I'm doing a minimum 30-day carnivore reset, which ends in a liver cleanse. And for the rest of my life, I'm usually never turning on insulin in the morning because I'll have my breakfast would be a carnivore breakfast, which can be steak and eggs, could be sausage. Can be ribeye. It can be just some form of natural, you know, of a meat, of a plant, uh, animal-based protein and fat combined together. Because I think you're the one who pointed out that you know eating like really lean meats, like 10 percent or lower, is not exactly good for you. It's when you eat that high-fat ribeye that first it's very fulfilling, and second, it allows you to not have to eat. You know, you can go four, five, six, seven hours without eating without feeling hungry. So I think the higher fat content meat is essential for success. Yeah. In the beginning, you mentioned Angus burgers. Is there something specific to the Angus breed of cattle or is, or are you just saying that as just hamburgers? I mean, is there, is there a reason for that? Yeah. So my, my wife has three brothers, two of them own restaurants. And every time I go visit them, uh, you know, I love this, of meat called churrasco, which I think in English they call skirt steak. And he was telling me when I said, why is your food so tasty in your restaurant? He says, because he only buys Angus beef. So he's saying there's the different grades of meat. And he's saying that for a restaurant, the best, one of the best meats they can get, you know, other than the Japanese, what is it, Kobe beef or whatever, in the States is Angus beef is one of the better choices of meat you can get. So if you're in a supermarket and you have different versions of burgers out there, if you can get 100% Angus beef burger, you're probably getting the most amount of nutrition and quality of meat compared to other burgers, which may be not 100% beef, first of all, and mixed with a bunch of other stuff. So 100% Angus beef burger and ribeyes, in my mind, over the last you know seven years, is the best somebody can do when starting out their first two weeks in carnival. Interesting. And you mentioned, so you mentioned ribeyes and Angus beef burgers. I mean, is there, is there a fat percentage you're looking at 80, 20, 73, 27? Does it matter? Is it up to taste? I mean, ribeyes tend to be about 65% fat in general. So is there, is there a range you like to see them get? So, so to be completely honest with you, I just go to Costco, wherever I'm going, and I'm, I'm going to have to deal with the options I have available that day. But I will always tend to go for the higher. So if I have 15% fat and 20% fat, I'll go with 20% fat. But again, sometimes you go and there's only 10% fat and 15% fat. Then, then I'll go for 15% fat. I'll, I'll go, I'll try to buy, you know, in bulk, like, you know, those 20 pound, uh, I'm sorry, those 20 uh, patties per bag and I'll buy two or three of those. And then I'll buy as many ribeyes as I can. And then it's just very simple. Again, because cooking is a snap, right? You know, when you're doing a ribeye, and I like a medium rare, it's kind of like heat the pan, butter, throw the, the ribeye, salt, pepper, two minutes, turn it over, salt, pepper, two minutes, five minutes, I'm done, I'm eating. And, and what I, t- I wrote in the book, which people would not think is the case, when you eat this way, I believe you become a lot more conscious about your food because... You know, if you're eating a chicken nugget or orange chicken or whatever this thing is, it's like a little ball of something that tastes good. When you're cooking a steak, you become really cognizant. You know, this is an animal that had to give its life for you to live. And I feel you become a lot more respectful about your food and where it comes from than if somebody's just eating Cheetos and Doritos and it's just like something that tastes good to satisfy boredom. Yeah, there's a lot of people eating for non-nutritive causes, for sure. Um, let me ask you, you mentioned uh, 
you primarily working with men, I, I assume. Um, are you, do you have many females that follow this pattern or, or is it pretty much mostly men? And is there anything different you do for females? So the interesting thing is like when I started, I think the first two to three years, it was female dominant. And after the three-year mark, for some reason, which I don't know what it was, it became male dominant and also a lot of men having issues with the prostates or, or, or sexual function. Again, I'm not a doctor, but what I noticed was that as, as people would get on these programs, they would both get results. The only thing I would say is that men tend to do better on uh, one meal a day than women. For some reason, which I don't I don't understand it, but my observation, not to have a debate with anybody, it seems that women do better with, let's say, intermittent fasting where they have like, a, you know, the eight hour eating window um, and that men can get away with one meal a day a lot better than women. But that that's just, I don't know why, but the results though are the same. So just because women are not doing as many one meal days as men does not in any way take away uh, from the results they get from following a carnivore program. In fact, what I tell women is like, eat as much as you want. Um, and if you want to eat three meals a day, then just eat three meals a day. For some reason, with all the men, there's a very natural progression. And, and it happened to me during COVID because I, as I did not have to travel uh, to the Navy Yard to work, you know, you realize that as I start doing carnivore, I wake up, I, since I don't have to get in the car, I'm not hungry. So I started naturally eating my first solid intake of a meal, which is a ribeye, around 11 a.m. And then I would notice that I would eat my second intake of food around, you know, 5 p.m. With most men, that seems to be the case. And for a lot of men, it's very easy to do one meal a day. With women, you know, honestly, if they want to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, whatever amount of food it's good for them, it still works. They don't, they don't need to go in that one meal a day thing for them to be successful. And I also find like, it doesn't serve them as well for some reason. I don't know if you had any experience with that. Yeah, I mean, I, f I find often just women, for whatever reason, a lot of women just can't eat enough in one meal to to to, to meet their needs for 24 hours. I mean, I can sit there and eat four pounds of steak in one setting, you know, quite easily. And that's all the calories I'm going to need for a day. But, you know, to have a, have a you know, a woman sit down and eat, you know, two pounds of steak in one setting, it's, it, a lot of them will, there's some that can, but many of them are not going to do that. And they end up, you know, obviously, um, you know, when you're not taking in enough calories, it's a problem. You're hungry. You don't feel good. You know, you're tired. Your thyroid crank, you know, crashes a little bit and all those types of things, supposedly. Um, what, so, so, so now that you've said that, yeah. I think when I heard you talking, I may have now a little inkling as to why. I think women have been pounded this message of caloric restriction, right? Women have always been unjustly, you know, beaten up about not eating too much, right? Whereas men, you know, we want to eat for energy and performance. And I think in the back of women's minds, psychologically, and I could be wrong, it's just a, an idea got, they always want to see how they can use this to do caloric restriction. And one of my main tenets is it should never, ever, ever, ever be caloric restriction, whether you're doing, you know, feasting, intermittent fasting, or one meal a day, there should never, ever, ever be caloric restriction. And like you said, you know, if you need to eat five ribeyes, then you eat five ribeyes, whether it's over three meals, two meals, or one meal, me, it's irrelevant. But I don't know if women want to take the advantage of this as a way to do caloric restriction, and perhaps they're not honoring their needs for like, I need to eat more. I don't know. Well, I mean, I think, you know, we just, we have this, you know, sexual dimorphism within our species and men traditionally want to be big and strong and women often want to be, they want to accentuate the difference. So their, their, their goal maybe in many cases is to be small and dainty. I mean, that's obviously a, a, a dated stereotype and a lot of women do well being stronger, which I think is great. Uh, but, you know, so you have that pressure for a lot of them and they're, you know, they, 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 they've gone for who knows, decades eating, under eating, you know, conscious about putting on any weight at all, whether it's muscle or fat, it doesn't matter. They don't want any weight. And so you have those eating patterns that sort of develop over a lifetime. And it can be very, I mean, very problematic, I think. Um, let's talk about, um, you know, I, the, you know, you've written a book. Um, I can't imagine the whole book is, you know, eat Angus burgers, ribeye steaks, and then do a liver cleanse. What else is in there that somebody might be interested in? Is there some sort of other things that you're practicing that, that, that are going to be beneficial? 
So, so the main difference from the book and the coaching is that in the coaching, I do the, the Navy SEAL uh, stretching regimen. Uh, I was asked when I took the instructor course to not put it in print. So I can't put it in here, not because I signed an NDA. It's just that they asked, you know, don't put the system in print. So I said, I'm, I'm going to honor that. So I can do it through video or online coaching. But after the first month with the, where they've gone, you know, 30 days carnivore, we set the range of motion. And then the liver cleanse, we start adding, you know, uh, what I call slow-mo exercise. And the reason I picked it is quite frankly, is, is the safest way. Cause you know, a lot of this was done online, online coaching, right? So if I'm not physically there, the safest way to train a person who may have not had any exercise in five years is slow-mo training. By slow-mo, I mean, let's say a slow-mo body weight squat. I start them out, you know, you set a timer for two minutes and you want to do 10 seconds from all the way up to all the way down and then 10 seconds from the bottom all the way up. So if you think about it, that means it took you 20 seconds to do one squat in over two minutes, well, you should have done six. The reason it's safe is because there's no pressure to either load more weight or to go faster than your body can. And when you want to progress, what you do is you make the, the travel time longer. So instead of taking 20 seconds to go down and up, then you can make it 30 seconds. So if you make it 30 seconds from the top of the squat to the bottom, and then 30 seconds from the bottom to the top, that's one minute per squat, which you're going to do two squats in a two minute time frame. And what it does is it increases the time under tension, especially in the hole, right? A lot of people like to pop out of the hole, right? They just want to bounce out of it. Whereas when you're working this slow, methodical way, you're not just working the muscles, but also those surrounding tendons and ligaments and that hip socket when you're coming out of the hole. Same thing for the push-up, right? You know, no greater way to damage your, your shoulders than to go crazy on push-up and just go really fast or really hard. Whereas if you're, you're slowly and methodically going, you know, top of the push-up, and then you're coming down one, two, three, four, five. And then from the hole you're coming out, you're able to do something like, you know, if it's five down, five up, that's a 10 second push up. Over 60 seconds, you're doing, you know, what, five or six. Um, so it's very slow and methodical. And then what the other thing we try to do in the second month is we try them to do a 24 hour fast. And again, to me, the, Benefit of a 24 hour fast, like, yeah, you will drop two to three pounds in one day when you do it. And sometimes it's a great way to address maybe you go on a cruise ship and you went crazy and you just ate and drank a lot. But to me, the same with the carnivore, there's a, a mental discipline aspect to either doing 30 days carnivore or doing a 24, 48, and eventually a 72 hour fast that train your mind just as much, if not more than your physical and endocrine system. So that's the second month. Now, in the second month, I also finished a lower body range of motion for the Navy SEAL stretching regimen. In the third month, we start adding sprints because, you know, sprints are, are a great way to train. And I focus on uphill sprints because I've found that they're safer than flat sprints. And, and I got the idea from a, a book on strongman training because it's saying that, you know, because if you're training an uphill, you have to generate more torque every time you go up. And that increase of torque per step is the safety valve. Whereas I've actually sprinted on flat ground and pulled a muscle, you know, where that's never happened to me when I've done uphill sprinting. And I get, when I do uphill sprinting, it's not like uh, something very hard. I'm looking for 40 to 60 meters, which is, let's say 120 feet. And the goal is to start slow and then slowly build up to perhaps one or two maximal efforts and you know this may or may not be true but i found that you know there's this guy dr mercola that said that sprint type training can help boost uh, gh and all i found is when during COVID, when my wife couldn't go to the gym we went to a park and we started doing uphill sprints because there's something easy i could get her to do and we we're doing it together and i found that her body tightened and trimmed a lot but there was like a lot of emotional release so I'm theorizing, you know, and I don't have any double blind placebo control study to say what I'm going to say, but, you know, I don't know if the huffing and puffing that you do, you know, helps to clear out whatever emotional, you know, stagnation you may have. I know that in Chinese medicine, they say certain organs hold certain emotions, like the, the lungs will hold on to grief. The, the fear uh, will be held in the kidneys. Anger is held in the, in the liver. And I find that a sprint type workout where you're trying to go to as close to maximal as you safely can for that day, that huffing and puffing, that breathing 
clears away the emotions because I know on the days we did the sprints, all the stresses of the day went away and like those really annoying hard tasks that you've been putting off for some reason on the day after, on the day of the sprints, they're easy to tackle. I don't know if it's because of that, eat that frog mentality. Like if I just did sprints, anything after is easy, right? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, clearly there's a lot of evidence that supports exercise in, in, as a benefit to to mental health. I mean, that's that's pretty well documented. And, and you know, the, I'm sure there's a lot of physiologic things that are going on there that, that do that. And um, so what does the diet look like after that first month? I mean, is there, is there specific – recommendations or is it just you know i I can't imagine you say go back to eating doritos and garbage food but i mean what are you what are you doing after the carnivore sort of reset that you've you've established so here's here's how it usually works for people that want to lose 10 to 15 pounds they'll achieve that in the first month and at that point they can either do they can do a couple of things like depending some people get really excited about carnivore because again if they've been having joint pain issues gastrointestinal issues or anxiety or emotional issues, and they see those issues improve on the carnivore diet, that can be enough of a push for them to, if they don't go full carnivore, keep, you know, 70% carnivore. Other people might do, I think it was a book in the 90s by a guy called Dr. Amaro Di Pasquale called the, the Anabolic Diet. Mm-hmm. And what that this guy was recommended was five days carnivore, and then what they call kind of like a carb refeed 24 to 48 hours um, uh, a week. So kind of saying eat carnivore Monday through Friday and get 300 grams of carbs a day on Saturday and Sunday or just Saturday. And so the point is finding the off ramp that works for people. I think the main concern that I've had is from this has been, look, I go to this business lunches and I go, you know, you don't, you don't have to go back to the way you were, right? Because somebody who wants to lose 50 pounds is more likely to stay in carnivore for three months than somebody who just wants to lose 15 pounds and they're in the first month. So after the first month, the guy who just wants to lose 10 to 15 pounds, he's slowly incorporating foods, but if they stay on the weight scale, they'll see what takes them off course. The guys who will lose 50 pounds, especially if they paid money, they will stay on carnivore until they reach their chosen weight. So like the guys I've said, I need to lose 45 pounds. Those guys will likely stay on carnivore or only have one cheat day um, a week. Because every time they have the cheat week, the, the cheat meal, they know they're going to go three to four pounds up. So if somebody's trying to hit 235 and they're at 250 and they have a cheat meal, right? And they go back to 255, knowing how hard it was for them to get from 260 to 250, right? They know that those five pounds are not worth uh, living that way every single day. But, you know, they're human. They've got kids like, you know, like you and I know, like uh, ice cream is not good for you. But I also believe there's nothing more wholesome than eating ice cream with my daughter. Right. So that's an experience I want to have with my daughter. So that, you know, when she's 50, she can remember eating ice cream with me. But I don't want to make eating ice cream a regular thing. I think the other thing that I think people need to be aware of is there's a lot of foods that people think are healthy that are not, like, let's say, bread or whole wheat bread. And that's why I said, you know, you may want to read wheat value as well. Because, you know, there's a lot of suggestions from whether it's the American Medical Association or doctors that people follow them, but they don't get better, right? And then you're coming along and suggesting this thing, which is a lot simpler. Uh, What I love about the carnivore diet is simplicity, right? Meat, water, salt, pepper, done. That's it. That's your shopping list, right? The only thing that people have a problem with is, is the boredom. And then at that point, when, like in online coaching, that's where we start tweaking it where it's something that they are happy and can live with and can sustain. Most people are able to sustain their weight um, for years after we do the initial coaching because they know that if they ever go off track, like I had a guy, uh, the guy in the initial of the book, he went through his 45 pounds. We did three months. He got it. You know, two years later, goes on a cruise, puts on eight pounds, right? He's freaking out a little bit. So all he had to do was just, you know, kind of do carnivore for a couple of days, do the liver cleanse, done. So in three days, he undid the five days of his crew. And then he just finds the right balance. And the thing is, everybody's different, right? Some people may want to eat carbs every day using that visual system where it's just a small amount of carbs. Other people are happier eating five days carnivore and having one cheat day where they'll eat pizza and ice cream they'll go overboard. So at that point, the off-ramp, I think, is very personal and has to be customized for the person so they can live with it and be happy with it. And then it turns into a lifestyle. It's not a three-month thing. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, 
Unfortunately, we are just about out of time, Eric. I appreciate you you being here and sharing your your experience and your thoughts. Um, where do, where would people go to find out more? Do you have some social media that you participate in and and, and just share that stuff if you don't mind? Sure, sure. Um, if you want to get the book, uh, Phallus After Forty, it's on Amazon. Uh, interestingly, um, I was going to use the Navy SEAL system uh, with vets um, as part of a foundation I did, but you know. Three people who were in business asked me, why was I using that model? And I, and I had to be honest and say, because I don't know any better. Uh, this is what I saw when I got out. Uh, there was veterans organizations that helped me. They were 501 Charlie 3. So that's what I wanted to do. So what I'm doing now is uh, I started a separate company using the service disabled veterans small loan businesses. And I'm going to be going to New Hampshire and working on clinics that deal with veterans and first responders. Uh, sharing the Navy SEAL system to help them. So uh, I've put the coaching on hold to work on veteran and first responder care. But again, I am on Instagram, on Facebook as Eric Dubman. Um, and if you are interested, just shoot me an email or shoot me a message and, and we can chat. And as soon as I uh, do proof of concept with uh, Forge VFR, veteran and first responder, I, I can uh, give you an update on how that's going. Okay. Well, awesome. Well, thank you very much for being there. The rest of the folks will be back tomorrow. Tomorrow we don't have a guest, so it'll be open for them. So we'll just, if you guys have questions that you didn't get a chance to ask today, tomorrow's a great time to do that. Okay, everybody. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Appreciate it, Eric. Have a good one, man. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Take care.